So I'd like to talk about error analysis, a um, subject on which Wilkinson did a lot of work, as we've heard, um, and look at the question of the fact that it's um, worst case and whether taking a probabilistic viewpoint can give some new insights. And this is joint work with uh, Theo Mary, uh, who's a you know, postdoc in, uh, in, in the school here. So, um, just to emphasize once again, the 1963 uh, book, Rounding Errors in Algebraic Processes, is where um, Wilkinson, first of all, collected a lot of his um, previous work on, on rounding error analysis. Um, actually, a lot of the book was for fixed point analysis. Um, also, block floating point, something we don't hear of today. Um, and then the later algebraic eigenvalue problem um, has a lot of error analysis in there as well. Um, pretty much largely uh, floating point error analysis. So let me just recap on the landscape of floating point arithmetic today. We've heard a little bit about this already. Um, so until not so long ago, we really only had two precisions, single and double, um, which I'm calling FP32, FP64. So defined in the IEEE standard in 1985, the 2008 revision defined half precision, FP16, and quadruple, FP128. And um, so those are the four current IEEE standard arithmetics. Uh, a more recent arithmetic is BFLOAT16. <coughs> Now, BFLOAT 16 was introduced by Google on their tensor processing units a few years ago. And it's um, also um, about to be taken up by Intel. So in the, the future Cooper Lake um, range of Xeons will have, uh, F, it will have BFLOAT 16 on it. So we may have it on our desks before too long. And I just want you to look at the two things. The range, so 10 to the minus plus or minus 5 compared with the quadruple, really huge range. And also the precision, the last column, you know, about three decimal digits worth down to 35 decimal digits worth. So there's a huge range of precisions and actual range of the numbers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about rounding, so I thought I would just put up um, the sort of standard um, result here and just show you the typical toy floating point number system. Um, and the point about this is really just to remind you that the floating point numbers are not equally spaced. Um, and every time you hit a power of 2 in a base 2 system, um, the spacing increases by a factor 2. So if we want to round a number, for me in this talk, rounding means rounding to nearest. So you're just trying to map a given number onto the nearest grid point in, in the floating point system um, called F. And we know that the, um, the relative error in rounding delta there is bounded in modulus by little u. I call it unit round off. In general, it's a half beta to the 1 minus t, or 2 to the minus t in, in base 2. Okay, so that's the operation of rounding, or round to nearest. Here is the model that Wilkinson uh, used um, for the error in a floating point operation. So that whether it's add, subtract, divide, times, uh, the, the idea is that you take your x and y, already floating point numbers, you do the operation, and the relative error delta is bounded by the unit round off. So this has been in use now for, what, maybe 70 years since the beginning of digital computing. Um, and um, so this is what Wilkinson used. There's a, 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 a little sh example from a 1960 paper of his. It's exactly the same as, as, the, as the yellow box above, except <coughs> that he used epsilon instead of little u. So the question I'd like to ask is, is this model still um, an appropriate model? And what are its weaknesses? So here are three weaknesses of the model. So first of all, it's a worst case bound in, in that model on delta. So that's telling you the worst case that could possibly happen. So it necessarily isn't going to be a good predictor of, of the average case behavior. Um, that model doesn't take account of modern hardware. So there are a number of features in modern hardware that just aren't captured by that model. And then thirdly, um, that model is actually weaker than what, what the IEEE standard says. So the IEEE standard says that you have to take the correctly rounded result. And that model is actually weaker. So. Does that matter? Do these things, three things matter? Well, I think the first two do, the last one less, and perhaps not at all. So I'll just say a little bit more about each one. I'll begin with the third one, this thing about the rounding um, being stronger than what the model shows us. So just let me take a very simple example. So x is 9.185. I'm going to work in base 10 to two digits. So when I round to nearest, I get 9.2. And the delta in this equation is shown in the third column, and that is less than little u, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 2. So this line here is just telling us what we know from the theorem on the previous slide. But what you notice, if you look at 
Y is 8.8 .8, uh, down to 9.6. For, for all those other Ys that aren't highlighted, the, uh, the delta also satisfies the bound in the theorem. The mod delta is less than the little u, the unit round off. So it's not just the correctly rounded number that satisfies the model, uh, the rounding model, but a whole load of numbers and, and any, any number in between. So in that sense, the model is rather weak. And that's something that often isn't mentioned. Um, does it matter? Um, well, my, my qu the quick answer is not really. Um, and we can talk about more about that later. But I don't think that is um, the key feature of the model that we need to worry about. Just it, but it is weaker than correct rounding. The second thing I said was an issue with the model was that it doesn't uh, fully encapsulate what modern hardware does. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for this. Um, the first one is the fused multiply add, something that Intel chips had in the late 1990s. And now a number of machines have, for example, a number of GPUs have this. So a fused multiply add is when you do a times and an add, so x plus y times z, in one clock cycle with one rounding error. So normally this would take you two clock cycles, one for the times, one for the add, and you would have two rounding errors here. But with an FMA, it's a hardware instruction that somehow does that whole operation with just one rounding error and with, with what in one clock cycle. So this basically means that the, the error in that operation is, re bounded, is reduced by a factor two. So instead of two rounding errors, in worst case rounding to u, you've got one rounding error bounded by u. Um, so um, that means that your algorithms will in some sense be a factor two more accurate perhaps than you would have thought if you didn't know that an FMA was being used internally in when you code inner products and things like that. So that's something we often benefit from without even realising it. I should just mention that there are some problems with FMAs to do with the, um, the semantics of what, it, what an FMA means. Sometimes it's ambiguous and you're not quite sure how the compiler will interpret an expression if it can liberally insert FMAs all over the place. So there are some, some issues, but on the whole, it's a good thing to have and something that we are exploiting more and more nowadays. Um, secondly, something we've had for many years is 80-bit um, registers on Intel chips. So in other words, your 64-bit arithmetic can be benefiting from some temporary use of these 80-bit registers, and that can give you a bit of extra accuracy, a bit of a boost. Um, and this is something that happens at such a low level that you don't really know exactly when it's being used. This will be something you know, deep in some kernel provided by Intel maybe in some Blas routine. But this is another reason why we might get better accuracy than the model uh, would predict. Finally, um, we now on, on the number of GPUs have tensor units. Well, the Google and, and, and NVIDIA, Turing and Volta architectures. Tensor, these units can do this operation here, but with X, Y and Z now matrices. So in the case of NVIDIA, X, Y, and Z are four by four matrices. And now the whole four by four matrix multiply and add is done in one clock cycle with one rounding error per matrix element. And this gives you quite a significant speed boost as has already been mentioned today. So again, that's something that clearly the basic model isn't, uh, isn't able to take account of. But what I really want to concentrate on is um, the, the question of, pes uh, of um, the worst case bounds. So the model is necessarily saying what, what is the worst case on that delta, and the worst case is it's bounded by u. So let's, let's have a look at some um, a little computation here, two examples. So these are done in, um, in single precision, FP32. <coughs> and I've taken on the left um, a matrix vector product. So it's random A, random X. I'm doing A times X, and I'm plotting the, the error in that, uh, that uh, approximation for a range <coughs> of N. And on the right, I'm solving a linear system where A and um, B have been chosen randomly. And what you can see is in yellow, the actual error. Um, and in blue, <coughs> you've got the tr uh, traditional error bound, the Wilkinson style bound, uh, that basically the bound you would find in his books or papers. And there's really two things to note about those plots. One, there's quite a gap between the bound and the actual error. But probably more importantly, and this has been alluded to already today, it's the rate of growth. So the rate of growth is wrong. It's not just that there's a big gap, but you're getting the wrong prediction of the rate of growth of the error in, in both cases. So that's for single precision. Um, this is for half precision on the left. And on the right, what I've called FP8, doesn't really exist, but Cleve used this on his blog, so I've adapted those parameters. It's a kind of quarter precision arithmetic. Um, same, same picture, the, the actual errors are much less than the, um, the bounds. But what you notice here is the bound hits one um, quite soon. So once the bound hits one, it's giving us no information at all, not guaranteeing even maybe the correct sign in the results. 
So with low precisions, this is an issue that you very quickly can get error bounds that, worst case bounds that tell you um, essentially nothing at all. And yet, as we know, low precision is, is now more and more uh, prevalent in hardware and, and people are starting to use it. Now, th there's a point here that um, something that Wilkinson was well aware of and, and often commented on, in fact, in his papers and books. So he said that the statistical distribution of rounding errors uh, will reduce considerably the function of n occurring in the relative errors. So we might expect that the function could be replaced by something which is no bigger than its square root. So what he's saying is that when you have an error bound of the form function of n times unit round off, you can replace f by its square root and get a more realistic error bound, even if that might no longer be a rigorous error bound. Okay, so this is an exact quote from his 1961 paper, but he's, he mentioned this on, on, on several occasions. But he never gave any further elaboration of that statement. So why was he saying that? Well, we don't know for sure, so we don't have anything written down, but um, we can be fairly confident that this is the argument that he was, um, was, was thinking to, to, to reach that conclusion. So let me suppose I have a sum S of n delta i's. I'm thinking of these delta i's as rounding errors in, in the model earlier. Um, and that each of the deltas is therefore bounded in modulus by little u. So clearly the worst case bound is mod s bounded by n u, just by taking the, tri the triangle inequality in, in the first yellow box. That's the worst case bound, but in some sense it's unlikely, unless all the rounding errors happen to be the same sign and maximum magnitude. So we might assume that the delta i's are independent random variables and take mean zero. And if we do that, then we've got a sum of any of these things and we can invoke the central limit theorem. Uh, and that tells us that for large enough n, um, s divided by n to the half will be approximately normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared and, and sigma bounded by u. And so with high probability, um, s will be within some constant uh, factor root n of uh, the unit round off. Uh, for example, 99.7 probability with uh, lambda is 3. So essentially, a central limit theory argument, argument gives you uh, Wilkinson's rule of thumb. But there are two problems with this, um, this thinking, I think. First of all, at the top there, S is a linear sum of, round, of, of, de of rounding errors. In practice, we get nonlinear functions of rounding errors. So this is really just looking at the linear part of the rounding error. So we then have to worry, well, what about the nonlinear part? You know, can we really ignore the higher order terms? Uh, more worrying for me is that, that, that statement for sufficiently large n. What is, a lot, what, I, what is sufficiently large? Is n is 10 okay? 100, 1,000, million? You know, how, n, how large does n have to be before this, this becomes a useful approximation? And as far as I can see, the central limit theorem just doesn't give you that information. Okay. So, so that, I think, is the thinking behind the rule of thumb. But what I'd like to do in this talk now is, is try and give a, a more rigorous foundation to that idea of take the square root of the, of the constant in the error bound. And the way I'm going to do it is by looking at um, this lemma. So this is the lemma I use in my book on which almost the whole book is based. So it's just a lemma on having a product of um, one plus deltas, and these delta are, deltas are from the rounding error model. Um, and the lemma says that you know, how, f how close is this product to one? Well, it's within a factor theta, uh, a distance theta, Theta's bounded as shown there. So by what I call gamma n, which is nu over 1 minus nu. So basically, the, the theta is bounded by nu plus higher order terms, essentially. So from that lemma, you can then go on to derive error bounds for inner products, matrix vector, matrix matrix, LU factorization, and so on and so forth. So if we can have a, uh, a probabilistic version of this, we can then build on that uh, probabilistic versions of many other results. Okay, um, and I'm going to focus on backward error results in this talk um, because as we know, you can get forward error bounds from backward error bounds. So if you can do backward error bounds, we might as well do that. So what I want to do is derive a probabilistic version of that result where hopefully I can get something smaller than an N in, in the bound. To do that, I'll need to make some assumptions and I'll use this model here. So the model says that in the same um, equation as we had before, these deltas are going to be assumed to be independent random variables of mean zero. So you've got a sequence of computations. Every scalar operation has a rounding error delta. That collection of deltas I'm thinking of as independent random variables with mean zero. But I'm not assuming anything about the distribution. 
Here's an important quote from Tom Holt and Swenson in the 60s. Uh, There's no claim that all rerounding and chopping are random processes. Um, the question to be decided is whether or not these particular probabilistic models, and he was looking at models like this, um, will adequately describe what actually happens. So I'm not claiming that that model is always true. What I want to know is if I make that assumption, do I get useful uh, results? Do I, can, I, can I verify the rule of thumb? Let me explain why the model might not be applicable in a particular situation. So first of all, the rounding errors might be zero in many cases. If you add two integers or multiply two integers, you'll get zero error. Uh, if you multiply by a power of two or divide by a power of two in, in binary arithmetic, you'll have zero error. So those deltas are clearly dependent. Um, you might have two lines in your, your code that do the same thing. You might say x is 1 over 3 on one line and y is 1 over 3 on another line. You've got exactly the same rounding error on those two lines. Those two rounding errors are dependent. Um, there are examples, particularly due to Kahan, where you can see in a picture that rounding errors are correlated. And finally, and perhaps most subtly, in a non-trivial algorithm, later quantities depend on earlier quantities. Those early quantities have rounding errors in them, therefore the later rounding errors have some dependence on the earlier rounding errors, which again means they're not totally independent. So there are a variety of reasons why the you can argue the model uh, might not hold, um, but let's see if it will give useful predictions. So we, we want to now try and derive a version of that basic lemma. Um, so the lemma had the, the products of 1 plus deltas in it. Now it's not e so easy to an analyze a product, so I'm going to turn it into a sum by taking the log. So I get sum of log 1 plus deltas. Now we can apply something called a concentration inequality, um, which is really not so well known in numerical analysis. I think in some proofs of optimization convergence, I'm told that these, these things are used. Um, so what does it say? It says you've got n um, random variables, independent, bounded by these CIs, and it gives you a, a, a bound on the probability that the sum differs from its expectation by a certain value. So the sum differs by its expectation by at least xi, with probability bounded above by something that's got... But these are zero mean random variables, right? These are um, just random independent. So they have to differ from their mean, though, by very little in order for the sum to differ from its mean by very little. But we have a minus xi squared in here. So as you increase xi, this goes down very rapidly. That's the key thing really to note about this inequality that will, will turn out to be very important. So what we're going to do is apply that concentration inequality to um, these log 1 plus deltas. These will be our xi's. Okay, so in order to apply the inequality, you have to do a little bit of uh, fiddling about with Taylor series for the log and for the expectation of the log. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, and then finally, you will take the exponential to get back into the, the product that we started with. So once you've done all that, let me show you what you end up with. So this is the probabilistic version of the, uh, the fundamental lemma. So assuming the model is true, then this product of 1 plus deltas differs by, from 1 by uh, theta n bounded by a gamma n tilde, which um, is given explicitly by that exponential. And to first order, this is lambda root n u. So the n that we had in the worst case bound has become a root n in the probabilistic bound. But we do actually have an exact expression for this, this thing here but with a certain probability of failure um, given by this. So you choose the lambda in this result. You can take any lambda you want, 1, 10, 100, whatever. You'll have a certain probability and you'll have a certain bound. So a few comments. So th the probability that the bound holds is 1 minus the probability of failure, if you like. So the bound will hold with a certain probability, which is 1 minus p lambda. Well, I just mean this thing here. I mean, this, this is only second, first order, and this is exact. You just back solve the concentration inequality for the, for the probability. So it's an exact bound. Um, we don't require n u less than 1, interestingly. Remember, the, the previous gamma n had a 1 minus n u in the denominator. Um, that's a bit of a red herring. That's not really a, a, such a problem. Uh, importantly, there's no assumption of n being sufficiently large here as there would be if we applied the central limit theorem. So this applies for any n. You can take n is 1, 2, 3, whatever you like. And um, because of this minus lambda squared, you don't have to take lambda very big to, to get a small probability. For example, p of 5 is less than 10 to the minus 3. So if you take lambda is 5, that, that bound will hold the probability um, 
within 10 to the minus 5 of 1. So having got that, and I want to apply it, and I want to apply it to, um, first of all, um, inner products. So I've got A transpose B with A and B vectors. Um, I'm going to give a backward error result. I perturb the A here. I could have also perturbed the B. It doesn't really matter. So you get the, the computed result is the true <coughs> result for a perturbed A when the perturbation on A is bounded as indicated there. Um, you choose lambda and the bound is lambda root NU. Same thing with probability of failure. Uh, now you get an N in front of that P though. So now there's an N. Again, you can choose any lambda. From that, you can then get a result for matrix vector products. And then matrix matrix products. Let me, let me go on right on to the LU factorization result. We've heard quite a bit about LU today. So this result says that as long as the um, LU runs to completion, then the computed factors satisfy this result. They're the true factors of a perturbed A, bounded component-wise by the same gamma and tilde as before, times the product of the absolute values of the LU factors. Um, but now the probability of failure has a cubic polynomial in front of it. Interestingly, the cubic polynomial is half the operation count for LU factorization. And this tends to happen in our bounds, that the, the factor in front of P tends to be half the cost of the computation. But, so I'm confused. Are we st uh, magically assuming the errors are mean zero and independent? Or? Yeah, that's, that's the model. I'm that, oh, so you're that in that Throughout the, the rest of the talk, that model I stated is, is in effect throughout, the right. throughout this talk for all that's the theorems. That's a big question, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, it's a bit annoying to have these, this, polyno this cubic polynomial in front of P because it starts to look as if the probabilities might be getting rather big. So, key question is, w when is this going to be of order 1? I want, I want this to be of order 1, certainly. If you, if you solve this for lambda, you find that lambda will have to be of order root of log n, which is very slowly growing. So actually, the n-cube isn't such a problem. And it's thanks to the negative exponential in, in the p that, that, that that's the case. So for example, if you take lambda is 13, then for n up to 10 to the 10, the probability of failure is bounded by 10 to the minus uh, 5. So th there's, this is very likely to hold even for n larger than the systems we can even solve today, the largest n systems. And just to show you a bit more of that, um, here are some more realistic values of n. Here are some lambdas. These are the probability now of success. Um, so if you take n is 10 to the 4, lambda is 9, um, probability essentially 1 to 4 significant figures. Okay. So let me show you some experimental results to see if we can um, see how this, this uh, pans out in practice. Uh, he so here we're simulating um, half precision and FP8 with um, actually our own chop function. Um, and we're going to compute the backward errors in, uh, in some computations, matrix vector product, solving x equals b, and um, we're choosing um, a and x here. Um, and random entries, so random a and b and x from either minus 1, 1 or 0, 1. Same plot as before, showed you that earlier, and in red now are, is the probabilistic bound. So it's much better than the um, worst case bound, albeit still a little pessimistic. If I change to from um, minus 1, 1 to uniform 0, 1, so now the probabilistic bound is pretty bang on here. So it, it's essentially sharp in for this, this class of problems. So interestingly, that tells us that we're not, we're not going to do much better uh, unless we make further assumptions on the, um, on the underlying um, rounding errors. Um, these are the low precision computations. Again, this is the same problems I showed you earlier where we were hitting 1. So the probabilistic bound is, is um, still giving us the information even when the worst case bound has hit one and is telling us nothing at all. Um, and this is the same thing now for half precision and quarter precision. Um, what about some real life data that's non-random? Well, here's a collection of matrices from Sweet Sparse, um, Tim Davis's uh, problem set. Um, again, actual errors in yellow, worst case bounds in blue, probabilistic bounds in red. And you can see we're doing much, still a little bit of a gap, but we're getting smaller bounds and with a more realistic rate of growth as well. Um, I really haven't got time to go into this slide. I will just say we do have examples where the model fails. One example where it fails is when you have inner product of two large non-negative vectors. And um, th there is an explanation there, but I don't think I've really got time to go into it. Um, so we, we, we can certainly identify cases where the model is not valid um, and the probabilistic bound is actually less than the thing it's supposed to be bounding eventually. So to finish off, um, this is now a rigorous justification, I think, of Wilkinson's uh, rule of thumb. Uh, 
Um, so the, the key idea was not to use the central limit theorem to use a concentration inequality. Um, and the bottom line is that these probabilistic bounds are substantially smaller than the worst case. They're still a little way off the, the actual errors in, in many cases. This quote from Kahan is very appropriate. The fact that rounding errors are neither random nor uncorrelated will not in itself preclude the possibility of modelling them usefully by uncorrelated random variables. So that's sort of answering the question that Hull and Svensson posed and, and what we're doing uh, agrees, agrees entirely with Kahan's um, quote there in the green. So thanks very much. I'll finish there. In the picture you've showed, I think the input was random. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you know what happens if you try to compare the actual error for the worst possible input with the worst case bound. Will it grow the same way, or, or do you know? Um, so when you, say, when you say the worst possible input, do you mean in terms of the, the, that achieves the worst case bound? Something like that. Yeah, so there are, there are for an inner product, for example, you can write down a set of data where the worst case bound is achieved. It's a sort of very unlikely to occur. Um, but so the worst case bound is then sharp, so you know we can't do any better than that. No, so this is not very interesting from the point of view of sharp. illustrating the results. Yeah. So it seemed like positive correlation was something that could cause actual errors to be bigger than these um, mm. probabilistic error bounds. I was wondering whether you've thought at all about whether you can have negative correlation between errors, whether that's something that would occur naturally or something that you could engineer in such a way that would actually cause the error to be much lower. Um, I think you could. Um, I mean, the examples where that we have where the model fails are include non-zero mean for the rounding errors and correlated rounding errors. And the correlation could be in, in any sense you want, I think, really. So you, you can certainly find interesting examples. The question really is to find examples that are likely to occur in practice where, where this, this model fails. I think those are of particular interest. You know, not examples that are too extreme. Oh, there was one. Yeah, okay. So if you put Francois Chatelain's uh, rounding uh, procedure from the 80s where you choose the last bit rather than in our classical rounding, but choose it randomly and run experiments to do a statistics. W how, how would that uh, come along with your bounds? Do you know that? Oh, so you mean force the deltas to have a certain structure in, in the rounding error model? Yeah. Um, so this is the Venier work on yeah, uh, yeah. stochastic rounding. Um, it's really a different process because there you're deliberately not computing the right answer, but you're generating a distribution of answers. Just so take a different distribution for your rounding errors. You, you make them uh, Bernoulli variables. Mm. What, minus one one. Then you you, you could you could do that. Yeah. You can apply that. You could do that experiment. Also, so. yeah. Uh, yeah. If you yeah. just choose a different, mm. you can still uh, plug it all into your Höfting yeah. uh, concentration inequality. Yeah. It applies. So you could just do mm. that. Yeah. Mm so maybe it's a sociological or historical question. Mm -hmm. So this idea of the probabilistic side of computing is very old. Von Neumann was interested in that. And mm -hmm. a an, an big example in discrete ODEs, Henrizzi's book from 1963, mm -hmm. gave mm -hmm. a lot of attention to the, the square root of N effect. Mm -hmm. So um, there's something cultural, or for some reason this stuff hasn't caught on over the years. Um, is it your view that something has changed? I, I presume, I mean, although you have nice theorems, I presume that's, that's not the essential change. Do you think there's something about our new environment that makes it appropriate to do something that wasn't popular 50 years ago? Or were they all wrong 50 years ago? Wh what's your view on that? Well, well the, the motivation well, for this well, is, low, is low precision. So if you've only got four digits, n times u is then one when n is a thousand, okay. ten thousand. So suddenly, the worst case is so bad it's telling you nothing. Yeah. This will get you a little bit further, giving you some information. That's really was our motivation originally for, for looking at this. But Ilsa might have another view. Yes. Yeah, so lately, in the last twenty, uh, thirty years, there has been a lot of uh, progress in concentration inequality, scalar concentration inequalities, which, which Nick is using, but then also. Uh, matrix concentration inequality. So I think these new tools have made it easier to do the analysis. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, you, you were doing it sequentially, the summation. 
and mm -hmm. you made up there. What happens if yeah. you do it in parallel? So you have a tree to do that summation for the... the well, the worst case bound is then log n, yeah. and I think we would get root log n, yeah. wouldn't we, Theo? It, it, it's a different yeah. algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, uh, the same... Analyzed the yeah. of summation. Yeah. But if you do the mm. tree, then you have a, a smaller factor. Yeah. I think it's the same principle, though, yeah. applies. Yeah. Yeah, remembering mm. that story from Wilkinson, he was uh, giving a talk at the university. There was a sequence of talks, and the day before there was a banquet, and uh, Jim was sitting next to a bishop, and uh, the bishop asked Jim what uh, what field of work, it, what, what, what was his talk going to be on? And Jim answered, errors. And the bishop said, that's a coincidence, my talk is also on errors, but I call it sins. I think it was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, Jim yeah. was quick to point out that yeah. uh, his errors are uh, unavoidable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, can I make one final comment? Because Jim Bunch said something earlier. Limpact that we heard about this morning was written by Dongara, Bunch, Moller and Stewart, the manual. Right. We've got Dongara, Bunch and Moller in the audience. Yeah, of this 1970s package, so that's pretty impressive, isn't it? <laughs> so where is he today? Yeah. North Carolina. North Carolina. <laughs> living in a <laughs> retirement, <laughs> retirement community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, I guess we have a break now. Yep. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.